So um, I just wanted to show you guys real quick this lighting setup that I have that kind of makes it feel like I'm in an interrogation room. Um, so I could be in here if there's something like that. Um, I could also get a front light that makes it feel like there's like a, a, a bigger light on me. There's no front light on me right now. Um, this is in my kitchen. Um, I'm trying to think of the places that um, have that kind of, you know, I have this, um, I can't flip a camera in the middle of the video, but I have this long hallway, a bathroom. I have a guest bedroom that's not my own that we could turn into something else. I don't know. Uh, it also gets pretty dark inside of my space. Um, so yeah, that's right. And this is the living room here, living room. But I think, um, I think if we wanted something that's like very interrogational and kind of tight, um, that's a good spot to do it. Um, thanks for including me. Uh, I can't wait. Daddy, daddy, can I have some water? All I got is five minutes in this hallway. All I got is five minutes in this hallway. All I need is five minutes in this hallway. And me and these monsters can't lose. The week that everything was shutting down, we were constantly in conversation in the office and it was a conversation of, do we keep pushing forward because we have a lot of work to do for an event that's coming up on Monday? Or do we shift in direction and start preparing for what to do if we don't have this show? We were getting ready to launch an ambitious 2020 season with our flagship event, the 24-hour plays on Broadway in the fall, the 24-hour musicals in the spring, our young artist intensive, the 24 hour plays nationals in the summer, and a new live podcast event at WNYC's The Green Space on Monday, March 16th. If we can't meet in a physical space, how can we continue our mission in a time when you can't see each other? And what does that mean to be making theater in that time? During that previous week, it became clear that live events weren't going to happen. And my wife and I made plans to take the kids up to her parents. I was running around that Friday and I got a text from my friend Howard Sherman. And I said, oh, hey, I'm really busy getting my family packed up to go to Connecticut. Can I touch base with you on Monday? And he said, no, I need to talk to you now. So I was in my car and I called him up and he made the point that the 24 hour plays have always made work about the moment that we live in. Okay, at this show, we welcome everybody with every point of view. Do we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's get on with it. All right, our next guest is the last living Republican on Earth. <laughs> Evan Junkie. Oh. Thanks for joining us today, Evan. Oh, thanks for having me. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here, but I just, I just gotta say, uh, my last name it isn't Junkie, it's Jonakite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Evan. Uh, 24 Hour Plays is incredible because it forces me to just do a thing. You show up, you introduce yourself, uh, the there's a like a pile of props in the center and then writers go right you know and and actors act because it is implicit in the title of the thing 24 hour plays lets everybody off the hook we already know that everything here happened in 24 hours it's amazing that anyone is even in the room our show has taken place after september 11th after hurricane sandy after the 2016 election. And in all of those events, we have discovered that writing and performing work in the moment we are living through has a power that is unmatched by 
something that takes longer to make. Obviously, the the events themselves are just an amazing thing. Creating plays overnight is, you know, crazy and fun and terrifying. Um, but also the other part of the 24-hour plays that a lot of people don't know about is just the the charity work that they do and the service work that they do and the nationals program. They have all these other tentacles that are, you know, uh, less flashy than the big Broadway uh, star event that they do every year. But uh, the grassroots stuff is much more uh, vital and interesting than the silly things that we do overnight, which is also fun and um, important, but not quite as important as, you know, raising up the next generation of theater makers. But it's like in the moment when you're doing it, you're having so much fun and then you realize you're helping this charity and you're just like, this is great. This is awesome. And it was only 24 hours. Like that's the thing is like, It feels so intense in the day, but it was only a day of your life. I'm no longer practicing. No matter who needs me, no matter how much money they have, I am no longer a doctor, I refuse. I mean, I can't keep saving lives or I'll never get to have one myself. (laughs) That's that's really brave of you to stop helping people (laughs) save lives. Coleman and I were slacking back and forth, and I'm like, hey, Howard called me with this idea. What do you think? We kick it around, and we said, okay, it has to be something that we can do in 24 hours because that's what we do here. And we usually gather people the night before the 24-hour plays for a meet and greet, and the actors all share a prop and a costume. They say, I brought a large box of adult diapers, or I brought a Chewbacca onesie. And we figured out a way that we could do that across a distance. So we're asking a lot of actors and a lot of writers separately if they want to do this crazy thing in 24 hours. Now they know what it is because they've been seeing them on Instagram. Before then, no one had any idea and we didn't even have any idea if somebody would say yes. So we were like crossing our fingers that we'd even get these videos back. So we asked a bunch of people on Monday. By Monday at 5 p.m., we have a list and Mark and Madeline and I go through that list together and put together what I would consider Mark's special sauce, which is his pairing technique. So he's pairing writers and actors together based on the type of work that they do, based on the kind of things they said that they really have always wanted to do. We're looking for successful artistic collaborations. So Mark pairs them together. And as of 6 or 7 p.m. on Monday night, the writers get an email with the actor's video saying, here's who you're writing for. Your script is due at 9 a.m. the next day. So we have everyone's script by 9 a.m. on Tuesday, and we start sending them out to the actors. And the actors have all day to memorize and rehearse and film. Most of them film multiple times until they have that final take, which for us is due at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So from five to six, we go into an editing frenzy where our editing team is editing the videos in practically five to 10 minutes each. We are watching them as they come in, as they go out of editing and before they go to posting. We're tracking each monologue's progress throughout the night. And that's like the most fun thing if you're like me and enjoy the kind of production manager-esque style of producing. So we're watching each of these monologues, posting them one every 15 minutes as we can, as they're being finished and uploaded. And by around midnight, they're all on Instagram and Facebook and going to YouTube. The first person who said that he would do this is David Lindsay Bear. And he is really one of the key collaborators for us and for me in this work. Well, the way the first monologue happened, actually, when Mark approached me, I said, can we please do it with Rachel Dratch? Because she's done almost all of my 24-hour plays that we've done. I always try to pick her um, because we get each other. She's always funny and she's very good at memorizing lines. And so Rachel said, sure, I'll do the monologue. Okay, this is Dratch part two. Uh, My prop is this weight because I was just doing um, a remote workout with my friend who's a trainer. And uh, you know what I'm calling my remote workout? Flattening the curve. Yes. The comedy machine is still cranking. And then she just You know, she submitted a video like all the actors do, saying, here's my apartment. I could shoot in my front steps. Um, And then I just thought, okay, 
this medium again what if she's a vlogger one of those makeup vloggers who can't do tutorials anymore because of the pandemic hey guys what's up it's me franny cakes coming at you wanted to just reach out and tell you guys my fans that in light of the recent corona outbreak i have had to make the hard decision of suspending my makeup tutorials um but i am the good news is i am hold up here in my apartment just like you are i'm sure and that's given me a lot of time for vlogging so i am going to carry on and instead of giving you guys tips about um contouring i'm going to give you guys tips about surviving the apocalypse so today i'm going to show you how to make a diy hand sanitizer and i've been using this for the past three days and i'm so far symptom free so i guess it's working right excuse my finger right there but um here it is this is the hand sanitizer um so what you're gonna do is let me grab this on my other hand what you're gonna do is you're gonna um mix together um let's see uh three quarters of a cup of aloe vera um 10 drops of lemon juice and one cup of rubbing alcohol now, um, I didn't have any rubbing alcohol, so I just used Bacardi rum, but mm, mm, tastes like Aruba. Um, anyway, it has the same effect, so there it is. I maybe woke up and they had sent it like three hours before, so I was a little behind. And then it was the same pro it was kind of weirdly the same process. I read it a few times and was like, oh, I got this. <laughs> and then a few hours later was like, I don't have this. I can't memorize this monologue. And it's not that long, but it's like usually when you have a monologue to memorize, you have a few more weeks or days or, you know, you have a little more time with it. And the, the time constraints definitely like catch up with you. So look, I know what you're thinking. Wait a second. Anna Banana? Isn't your sister the very famous actress Lana Banana? And weren't you accused of setting her house on fire last year? <laughs> so I'm supposed to list five things about me. Uh, so number one, I love pizza. But weirdly, to be fun, instead of calling it Za, I call it Zarza. <laughs> Uh, second thing is because I'm an heiress, I have very famous friends, so please respect my privacy and please respect George's privacy. Once I found the, the setup in my house, I kind of wanted to honor the, the 24 hour plainness of it. So I didn't do it that many times. I think I did it twice and then was like, this is what it would have been like if we were doing it live. So I'm not going to like, you know, like we're not going to do a million takes here. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it was, it was one of those things, like, I thought it was going to be, maybe be easier because I had control of it. Um, you know, like, because I was filming myself, but it weirdly, it still had, it still had the same challenges, but it was still the same exhilaration after I did it. Like, I felt, I felt really grateful to have had, like, an opportunity to act. And I really loved, I loved Mara's writing and it was this crazy thing where when they put it up on online, um, a bunch of mutual friends were like, oh my gosh, you guys should have met way long before. Like, you guys should have been working together. And I was like, I, had, I didn't know about her. Like, we just totally missed each other. And so it was like awesome to get to know a new writer who I'm such a fan of now. So much about who you get paired up with in, in, in this kind of situation, not in a like flashy way or whatever, but just, the feeling and the vibe and you know what they're looking for and what you're looking for and so you know they told me i was writing i didn't know who i was writing for and then you get the email and that one was just like yeah you got to be digs and i was like oh my god i'm just i won i kind of won um and uh he sent a little video and he was in his house and he had this cool hat as a prop and um, talked about things you wanted to do and you know as, as always happens in these whether you're doing it live or, or online you come in with some idea in your head and you think like, oh, I'm going to write this, or I'm going to write that. But then you meet the person, you see who you're actually writing for and you end up writing something completely different. Chris sent the script and it, it, you know, at that point, I think there's probably 
12 hours or so left in the in the time frame to get it in and i i didn't look at it for four of those hours and then uh, open it up and so this is brilliant and also it's a lot of words and so i uh, i but it was mostly for me about learning in in real time i got the hat i got the hat thank you for the hat it's uh it's not usually my thing, but I'm going to wear it to work, even though it's not my thing, usually. Stars. But I got the hat. Thank you for the hat. I'm going to wear it. I wish I was here when you dropped it off. Not that, I mean, it's not like we could have hugged and I'd have said, oh, thank you for the hat. Stars. Not really my thing, but I'm going to wear it. <laughs> not like we could have kissed. Not like I could have pulled you into the house. You know what? It's probably for the best that I didn't see you because I might have wanted to pull you into the house. I might have needed to pull you into the house. I know I would have wanted to, and that is not something that we can do right now. So thank you for the hat. I got the hat. The process um, is kind of the same as 24-hour play. It always works, and really as any theatrical process works. But so like first you just have to wrap your mind around the logistics of the piece you know what am i doing where am i coming from who am i uh and i only asked questions about things i didn't think i had a particularly good answer to because normally in a in a in a different process you would really take the time to like get the best answer um particularly the spirit of the viral monologues but really of all of 24 hour plays is we don't care about the best answer we care about an answer um, and, uh, and so once I had all the questions answered, I just started running it and I filmed every rehearsal of it, um, since it was selfie style. I just, I didn't, I thought I might only get it once. The 24 hour plays has been so supportive of me throughout my entire career. They reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be a part of, um, the director-driven 24-hour plays viral monologues, um, which was super exciting. And then there were there were some like kind of different options and guidelines of if um, you know you could do kind of a more standard um, like being paired with an actor writer. Um, I really prefer to work on contemporary stories. Um, I work. 99% in new play development. So um, the more connected to the now and here, the better for me. Um, I also really love dry humor um, and just, I will laugh at anything. So if it makes me laugh, I want to work on it. I sent in a um, video so answering awesome. some just simple questions about if there's anything I've ever really wanted to direct. That was sent to Lemon before we met on Zoom and also before he started writing. The next day, we spent some time just talking about where the idea came from. It's very personally based because he's at home. I asked him questions about like who this person was, you know, the similarities of, of you know, what he feels like Lemon and this guy are similar and like where they actually differ, you know, of like if like Lemon would be a little sterner with his daughter if she were trying to go outside without a mask than this character, perhaps. Are we on? Finally. Great. Oh my God, it's about time. Jeez. All right, here we go. Yeah, no, I've, I've never done this before. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I just thought this could really help me open up. A friend of mine recommended it from college, said it helped him. Okay. So do I call you Mrs. Robinson? Miss, okay, Mrs. Robinson. Okay, great. I'll, I'll start. All right, wonderful. Uh, well, I, I, I tell you, Mrs. Robinson, being a father in a house filled with quarantines, and when I say quarantines, I mean plural, daughters, it has its pros and its cons. It all depends on which day of the week the pros outweigh the cons. The pros are mostly Mondays. That's the day when the bears sleep in. But Tuesdays through Sundays, they wake up. And let's just say it's a disco inferno in here because the lights never seem to go off. You know, by and large, you're sticking a camera in someone's face. 
And so you get a strange intimacy that you don't always get in the theater. It's a very different thing. And it's obviously not quite TV and not quite film. Um, so it's, it's, and also because they're monologues, you're really just getting this, it, these interior thoughts of these characters in that moment, trapped in time, trapped in a place, trapped in a box. And that tends to make for good theater. Um, and so I've enjoyed that part of it. What happens if you stick a person in a box and they have to talk? That's a great assignment as a writer and not one that I've ever had to do before. So because of the speed, you get out of the way of trying to make it pretty and trying to make it nice and trying to make it all work on some level. You go with your gut. You go with what's going to best serve the, your team, your actor, your directors, and uh, you make the big choice and you run with the big choice. And sometimes it's a complete disaster. Um, I've written, you know, of the monologues that I've done, I would say like, two or three of them turned out really well and two or three of them were just like incomprehensible um partially because we wrote too complicated or somebody lost their way or whatever it might be usually even when they're incomprehensible they're really fun um but you can't you can't worry about that in this there's no time there's literally no time to think like is this going to work is this going to be a problem you just run hey paul what's up with the nuts and he said, oh, I always eat nuts while I'm working. They're a healthy snack. I wake up every day in prayer. And I hope to recognize something familiar in this unrecognizable time. For me, it's been an interesting exercise just to just to write every week and take my temperature as a writer, but also as a, as a person. And so it'll be interesting for me to look back and chart my psychological journey through the pandemic. The theater has always had to reinvent itself. Like this happens, this, ha this has happened before, you know? Um, and it's always evolved and it's always come back. I think we like need to gather and we need to express ourselves. It's just like, how do we, you know, how do we move forward in a different way now? And um, I just hope people, um, I hope people just don't go back to what it was before. You know, I hope things are different and I hope things are, um, yeah, new and exciting and that the stuff that was buried comes out and that um, we're not afraid of that. I hope that people uh, when we come back, understand that a lot of the models that we've been operating under um, don't really work for anyone or for like a very small percentage of people. And those small percentage of people are so desperate to hold on to what they have that it's like you can't even really enjoy it, you know? <laughs> so it's like, just let it go. <laughs> um, and maybe let's do something different that I think involves um, people coming together more on an um, equitable level. I have never taken more care in thanking collaborators, sending love to collaborators, and letting everyone know how grateful I am to be part of a community where we share the artistic process with each other in this way, where we are willing to sacrifice perfectionism in favor of immediacy, inspiration, and joy. And I would love to see us all, myself included, appreciate that and care for one another and care for the community in a deeper way than we did before the pandemic. We've survived this before. Art has always survived. Um, and even now, especially now with our connectivity online, we're learning that art really is a vital service online when you can't be together. The thing that we know about the theater is that theater as an art form, as theater as a thing that people do, doesn't go away, never goes away. And if anything, it becomes more resilient, more important, more powerful in times of suffering and in times of distance. And digital platforms are gonna help us to do that. You know, when I watch the viral monologues, I don't, that doesn't feel like watching TV to me. And it doesn't feel like watching TikTok to me. 
and it doesn't feel like any of these other things that I consume. You still feel the relationship between actor and playwright um, and between creative team and world that you only get from a piece of theater. So I think it's important to recognize that we, we figured out a way to do that and that we can continue to use that.